All right, part three of a million, looking at the effects of World War II in Europe. This video looks at the, um, the treaties and the social and economic uh, impacts overall. Um, we'll be looking at more specific areas a little later on in like, you know, video 1000. And you've seen these learning outcomes before. Keep at it. Which brings us to um, the Paris Peace Treaties in 1947. Uh, this was basically what the Council of Foreign Ministers uh, came up with in 1947. By the time we get to 1946, um, uh, France has joined the Council of Ministers. Day late, mm-hmm, dollar short, I don't know. And, um, and they come up with this uh, series of uh, treaties dealing with the aggressors of World War II. And so in looking at the Paris Peace Treaties of 1947, again, this is the US, the Soviet Union, Britain, and France um, negotiating these treaties with Italy, Romania, Hungary, Bulgaria, and Finland. And what they were hoping to do here, or one of the biggest things, was essentially to not repeat the mistakes that they had made um, at the end of World War One, which, as you know, was pretty much a spectacular failure. And um, so these treaties allowed these countries to uh, be sovereign, independent states and um, be part of the international community. So you don't have the ostracism that was faced by um, the losers of World War I. And it also set out um, for membership in the United Nations. One of the biggest things, of course, about this is that it um, handles uh, reparations. Um, and there were very heavy reparations uh, for all of these countries. And the Soviet Union felt the most entitled um, uh, because of the destruction that she faced and so on and so forth. So basically Italy had to pay 360 million, Finland 300 million, Hungary 300 million, Romania 300 million, and a significant portion, probably a good two thirds of that, or maybe one third of that, um, had to essentially, more than 50% of it, I know, I'm ham and hawing, but you guys know me in numbers, not France. Uh, had to basically go to the Soviet Union. And if anybody is interested in finding out, um, uh, when the Soviet Union fell apart, there was no revision of this treaty. So I wonder if these countries are still paying these reparations um, to Russia or, I don't know, to somebody. All right. One of the biggest things, of course, um, is that these treaties required that um, these countries recognize the rights, the human rights of minorities within their borders and um, to protect those rights. So this is essentially coming from um, the, uh, the Holocaust and how all of those various groups who were um, quote unquote undesirables in society were um, murdered. And so this was the end an attempt to guarantee human rights uh, for those smaller groups. Um, one of the things that they worked to do was to prevent the reestablishment of fascism. So those um, treaties said that these governments uh, had to make sure that fascism would not come about again. And so, um, um, and so basically they, you know, s some things were outlawed, so on and so forth. And um, we have massive border changes. We'll look at some maps a little later on. And, um, and Italy loses her African colonies. So essentially, um, uh, the Abyssinian invasion is uh, annulled and uh, Libya gets to have independence. And, um, and as stated previously, uh, these countries were not to be occupied um, and, and were not to be sort of um, uh, 
directly managed by outside organization. And so they had to establish democracy and then um, thereby qualify for UN membership. And so here we have an image of Warsaw, Poland. And as you can see, and I've shown you these pictures before, just different cities, um, showing you essentially that this destruction wasn't just isolated in certain areas the way that it was in World War I. Because of airplanes, because of terror bombing, it, ha it is across the entire continent. All right. And as we know, um, war has massive, 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 massive uh, social changes. And here we go. So uh, one of the biggest things about World War II is that we have the massive movement of people. Uh, as stated previously, we have millions, literally millions of refugees from German speaking areas. As borders shifted, um, people were forced to move. Essentially, um, uh, you know, at the end of World War I, they tried to create states to um, reflect the ethnic um, composition of areas, and that failed. And so now what they're doing is the borders are not changing quite so much, but they're moving people to form the, to, to change the ethnic composition of areas. And one of the biggest things that they wanted to do is kind of like remove that idea of Lebensraum, remove that idea of like pan-Germanism. Um, and so instead of, you know, like the, the millions of people you have, of Germans you have li living in the Sudetenland are going to be forced to move. The millions living in East Prussia are going to be forced to move, et cetera, et cetera. There is a massive exodus of Jews from Europe, and this is going to be um, really kind of detrimental because what you have is a loss of, a, um, of uh, human capital. And so you have a lot of people who were involved in the sciences, you know, people who had been um, pushed out of academia and stuff were leaving uh, Russia, were leaving um, Poland, Germany, um, Eastern Europe, and so a lot of people moved to the US, and then eventually you have the establishment of the country that shall not be named, um, and you have a massive resettlement of people into um, Israel. I named it. I'm living on the wild side. All right, we also have this massive change in social welfare. So, um, oops. So we also have this massive change in social welfare. One of the things that happens is there's this recognition by the governments um, that there needs to be more um, social support for people. Uh, and the idea, of course, is, or part of it is, um, you know, uh, the problems that happened with people um, with massive unemployment during the Great Depression. And the idea now is the government should be mitigating some of that. The other thing that happens is um, this has been happening since the uh, World War I, is you have a um, uh, opening of the franchise to more people, that is more average, normal, working class people can participate in the government and can vote. And one of the things that um, people are worried about is social support. So essentially one of the things that happens is a lot of the stuff that like the socialists had been pulling for, now remember socialism, different than communism, had been pulling for in terms of of redistributing some of the wealth of the society to all of its members in the case of like healthcare and education and um, uh, retirement benefits, so on and so forth, become an integral part of uh, the country's um, political system. And we have a massive loss of elites. So, um, so for example, a lot of the people in Czechoslovakia, as the Germans were forced to move out, you have um, elites of industry, of banking, whatever, are forced to leave. The um, exodus of uh, the mass movement of, of Jews out of Europe. 
You also have the um, movement of people who are just kind of disillusioned with the whole system who had been pushed out of like the academics, who had been pushed out of the arts, so on and so forth, are leaving uh, Europe. And what that leads to is some retarding of development. So you already have countries that are in very, very dire straits, like economically. And, and now the, the human capital um, that is needed to help rebuild that infrastructure that has um, the expertise to push the country forward uh, is leaving. And that's gonna have a negative impact on the overall development of the countries. And um, one of the things, of course, is uh, the deployment of nuclear bombs. If this ushers in the nuclear age. Um, now we have, and we're still dealing with the fallout, bum bum. Uh, I hope you got that joke, of, um, of this today, because not only was um, nuclear technology used uh, for weaponry, like in the atomic bombs, but now you have um, it being used uh, for things like um, power stations, for um, things like uh, medical equipment and so on and so forth. A lot of experimentation, a lot of development in the sciences. And so um, the post-war period is one is a nuclear age. And of course, as the um, Cold War heats up, it really, really becomes to the center stage. And um, this you see with threats of brinkmanship and use as a deterrent between the um, West and the US and um, uh, Russia. And as stated before, the, there's, there's this, the post-war period, um, despite this development of the Cold War, in many, many places, it is this really big time of optimism because people feel like they can change the world with technology and make the world a better place. And, um, and of course, they're coming off of this like incredible high of having like, you know, um, opposed fascism and won. And so there are these benefits of nuclear technology that are being used in hospitals to help cure cancer um, and uh, to develop uh, new machines like MRIs and so on and so forth. If there are going to be social changes, there are going to be economic impacts as well. So here's an overall view of some of the economic impacts of World War II. So, um, as we know, the economies of most countries were absolutely devastated by the war. There was this um, um, uh, isolation of people in rural areas, especially as infrastructure was destroyed. And um, so between the countryside and the city, there's not that you know communication, that is the roads that help bring the goods that um, each side produces. Uh, this was a total war. That means that um, it was a total war that lasted for a long time. Um, and this means that every, essentially every dime that they had or every, I don't know, pence or something, um, you know, dimes are very American. Every penny, uh, again, um, that they had was, um, uh, put into fighting this war. So essentially, the countries had no money left to rebuild. This was a long, long, costly war. And countries weren't prepared for war. Um, so there was a huge amount of debt. Uh, the United States and Canada, I know, I know, are the least affected. And this is going to be beneficial to the US and Canada because essentially they had functioning economies to help um, pump into Europe. At the same time, uh, this means that they are the only ones, mainly the US, that is able to um, inject money into these economies. 
as you know, there are high levels of unemployment. So the shift from wartime economy, we have um, a lot of people who had been working in the military who are now um, unemployed uh, because you don't need that large of a standing army during peacetime. You have uh, factories and industries, infrastructure completely destroyed. So they are not available to be able to absorb people. Um, if factories that are still standing, uh, they're no longer making munitions to be used in the war and other war material. So they also um, can't employ people. So high levels of unemployment and all of those problems that that brings about. One of the things, of course, is we have food shortages. Part of that was infrastructure. Part of that is shifting towards wartime economy. Um, part of that is uh, bombs. People would not, not enough people to work to produce food, um, complete. And part of that also is there, um, if infrastructure isn't there, then that, mean the f that means that the food that may be produced doesn't have a way to get to the markets that need it. You have strikes and civil unrest and people are scared. Um, people are homeless. People are hungry. Um, people are demanding that the government does something. And at the same time, these governments are in no shape to be able to deal with these issues. Um, uh, agricultural industrial levels weren't growing and that contributes to the level of unemployment, contributes to food shortages, and therefore contrib contributes to the strikes and civil unrest. And so here we have, I do love saying, and so here we have quite a bit, I'm sure you've noticed. Um, there is an image of people uh, protesting the civil um, in West Germany. And so uh, this is an example of the civil unrest. People are upset about the lack of food. People are cold. Um, people, and you can see that in the two years since the war ended, you see that that building in the back is still destroyed. So um, there hasn't been an improvement in the situation post-war uh, for a couple of years at least. Um, and so we have shifting of the economy with the destruction of the inf infrastructure. And so essentially, um, it's really difficult for the economy to recover uh, and attempt to go back to a um, peacetime economy. And this is going to be worse because we have huge numbers of displaced people, homeless or um, refugees, that need resources. They need food. They need shelter. They need clothes. Um, they need water. And so the... Um, the U.S. and Britain uh, shut down the arms industry in um, the Federal Republic of Germany. And, uh, and part of that, an attempt to um, that demilitarization uh, of, of Germany. And this, of course, means, well, less work. And so Germany faces an embargo on raw materials to be able to, um, to prevent them from uh, creating arms and stuff. The equipment, um, factories were removed. Um, and so this kind of uh, attempt to demilitarize and deindustrialize in a way, um, Germany results in um, a hindering of economic recovery of the rest of Europe. So one of the things um, that uh, we see at the end of World War I and we see here is that Germany is integral to um, the functioning of the economy in Europe. And so they see that this is a problem. And so because this is a problem, they um, look, will implement the Marshall Plan, or also known as the European Recovery Program. And this was in place from 1948 to 1952. And so the whole purpose of this essentially was a realization that um, a, an industrialized Germany is important in Europe's economy. And it was um, before World War I, it, it was in the interwar period as well, and then, um, and it continues to do so today. So Germany is in Central Europe. It essentially is like the heartland of Europe. And um, as a producer and as a consumer, 
uh, she is important to the economy of the other countries. And if there is no industrialized Germany, then that's going to make things difficult for other countries. And so one of the things that happens is there is the recognition that the economic um, impacts, the negative economic impacts of the uh, Paris Peace Treaties of 1918 um, helped to contribute to the rise of fascism and contributed to the um, instability in Europe. And so what they're attempting to do here is not repeat the mistakes of the past. And as you know, um, or maybe you don't know, but you should remember that John Maynard Keynes was a vocal um, critic of the Paris Peace Treaties, their economic impact, and predicted this sort of instability that was going to happen. And so he's also involved in this process. And once you have, by the time we get to 1948, and it's three years after the war, and it's like successive civil unrest and so on and so forth. There is um, this, and, and you also have the heating up of the Cold War, <laughs> again. Um, the fear of communism is gigantic. that's right, gigantic. And so the idea is, is that if the economies don't recover, if there isn't an improvement in people's lives, then that means that um, it provides an opportunity for people to turn toward extremism, and that is communism. And so um, what this Marshall Plan was supposed to do, the purpose of it, was to help remove trade barriers and modernize industry so that um, uh, economies were more competitive and more efficient. And we'll talk more about the Marshall Plan um, as part of our HL unit. All right. Um, the Marshall Plan was uh, rejected by the Soviet Union. Um, essentially, the Soviet Union saw this as the U.S.'s attempt to um, create hegemony and ex extend her influence. And so the Soviet Union saw that um, they would essentially be um, economically under the control of the U.S. One of the things that the U.S. did is that they essentially, they requested or demanded or um, made as part of participation in the Marshall Plan, their um, financial books had to be open to these um, technical and economic helpers who are coming in. So essentially, um, there would be no economic secrets. And the Soviet Union saw that as a loss of sovereignty. Now, part of the Marshall Plan included economic help, and that economic help came in the form of money, but it also included um, uh, uh, economists, so specialists who would go in and try to reorganize stuff, and then it also included technical help. Um, so one of the, the US's industry had um, leapfrogged over others in terms of efficiency, and so it was, um, uh, some of these technical experts on how to organize factories and um, how to build factories and and uh, and stuff like that who came in to help um, the European countries. And so between um, 1945 to 1952, 25 billion uh, was given to um, sort of inject money into these economies. And unlike the Dawes and Young plans, this was free. So again, lessons learned from the uh, situation with those plans and um, the depend dependency that this created, that those plans created. The purpose of the Marshall Plan was actually to help the countries recover on their own, not necessarily become dependent on loans. Now, of course, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Um, in addition to helping that money, it be having um, investing in the economies of European countries, um, those countries needed to buy manufactured goods and they needed to buy food and stuff until their domestic industries recovered. And so the US and Canada, whose industries were intact, definitely benefited. 
By the end of 1952, the economies of all of the countries who participated in the Marshall Plan were better than pre-war levels. So it was um, very successful. And as um, one of the purposes was to remove trade barriers within Europe, this actually helped to integrate the European economies um, together more closely, and this helped to pave the road for European integration and the EU that we have today. Baby steps, but the Marshall Plan laid the foundation. And so, um, Right after the war, uh, countries basically um, implemented austerity measures. They had to save money. They had to prioritize with the limited funds that they had where that money was going to go. And this is one of the things that um, created civil unrest because people are hungry. People need stuff now. People need housing. Um, people need um, support and some of that welfare state stuff. And so this meant that with the funds coming in, um, the, government, the governments didn't have to be quite so tight-fisted with the money, which meant that they could begin to meet people's needs um, sooner, and the result is going to be more um, civil stability. And here we have one of these uh, propaganda posters um, that were uh, distributed um, after the implementation of the Marshall Plan. The idea is, you know, Europe banding together to make everything happen. And so it's just um, letting people know that there is something happening and kind of trying to drum up that moral support and that commitment um, that you need from the people, especially in democracies, in order for things like this to be successful. Essentially, they were asking people to calm down a little bit, um, that they were working toward making things happen, and that everybody needs to contribute to making it a success. And here we have the, uh, a map of where the money went. So you can see which countries in, in Europe, primarily, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, um, France and, the, and Britain um, receiving the most funds. And uh, you haven't had a red question in a while, so here one goes. And so um, one, a question that often comes up is to ask you to compare and contrast the impacts of World War I and World War II. So I'm going to ask you to pause. This is the end of this video and go back to um, the stuff that we uh, did previously looking at the impacts of World War I and um, compare and contrast with the videos uh, that you've looked at um, so far about World War II. Please, 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 please do this because this is going to help you sort of um, sift through and um, uh, pull together information and it's also a nice bit of revision.